Last weekend, uh, we started a series on the book of Job, and so we, and we had Kyle Eidemann with us, and, and Kyle did a, man, I mean, I let, Kyle did a great job. I had an opportunity to catch that sermon. He did a wonderful job kind of setting things up for us, um, but he's a good friend of mine. He spoke great things about this church, and he's a senior pastor at a big church back in Kentucky, and so at any rate, thank you for being so welcoming to him, and he just couldn't say enough positive things about all of you and, and this church and what's happening here and what the Lord's doing through us, and we're excited for what was still going to happen even into even into the future but what Kyle talked to us about was essentially the beginning of the story of Job and the story of Job begins with a man who's very blessed things are going really well for him if if there was ever a person that the Lord's favor his hand was upon it was upon Job in this moment but then Satan we kind of catch a the curtain gets pulled back we get an idea of what's happening in the spiritual realm Satan then goes to God and he says God the only reason that he follows you that he worships you is because of how good you've been to him because how much you blessed him and so God says fine I have more confidence in Job than you do take anything you want from him but you can't take his life and sure enough that's what Satan does he goes he takes uh, Job's children from him they lose their lives he takes his business from them, so all the, their, their financial support, how does they take care of themselves, all that goes away. He takes his health, Satan takes uh, Job's health from him, and the only thing that Satan left that he could have taken was Job's wife. And then she's not in a bad, she's not in a good spot, she's in a really, really bad spot, she's grieving, she's struggling, and so she ultimately says to Job, hey, curse God and just die. So it's a bad, things are, things are not going so well for Job. And when in life things aren't going that well, well, really in life just things can be okay, but we still need direction. We still need guidance. We don't know exactly where to go. We often need people to come alongside us. We need, you might say, advisors. We need to get advice. We need to, at times, even give others advice. And that's what happens beginning in chapter 3 of the book of Job. Job begins to receive advice from these friends of his who have come into his life to explain to him what it is that is going on. And that's what we're going to be talking about. Now, we're going to really broad stroke this book of the Bible because there's about 24 chapters, 27 chapters, where essentially Job just gets the same advice. And that advice is this, is Job, you messed up. You did something wrong. I know you don't think that you did, but you did. You did something that God didn't like, and because of that, you're experiencing this pain, this punishment, this suffering. And so they come alongside him and they give him some advice. Yeah, I'm going to share a story with you. It's a bit extreme, a bit absurd, but it's very true of, a, of an experience that we had as a family of somebody that wanted to give us advice as well. So a few years ago, we're out at the bluffs in Lone Tree and we're hiking, and it was right after Christmas. Um, the weather was nice that day, but it had been really cold for a while, and our kids hadn't gotten out. They hadn't been able to do much, and so they just had a lot of pent-up energy. Now, if you haven't been to the bluffs, uh, there's a lot of switchbacks on the trail. And so, you know how switchbacks go. You, you see the next level of the trail, about 20 feet or so, 30 feet or so above you. And, and I know it's a thing, and you're not supposed to cut the switchback, and it's like this huge, I guess a huge deal for somebody, as we would come to find out. But my kids, you know, they're seven, they're nine, and they're kind of running up, they're doing the trail thing, but then they're cutting a few of the switchbacks, and at any rate, we're about two-thirds of the way through this little hike that we're on as a family, and there are a lot of, there's hundreds of people out on this trail, because again, it had been cold. All of a sudden, this person starts yelling, get off of the grass, stay on the trail. And they, they got to be a good 200 yards away, so you can imagine how loud this person is. And, and then all of a sudden we realize they're not just yelling, they're yelling at us. They're specifically yelling at my children, get on the trail, you're going to, and then, then it got really weird, you're going to kill the effing plants, takes a hundred, he's saying all these things, just screaming them, hundred years to grow those plants back, and and it gets weird, and I yell at my kids. I'm like, hey, come on, come on back, come on back. This is, this is really getting out of control. Like, we're just, like, they just ran up the hill. Oh, my gosh. And they know what plants they shouldn't step on that are not going to grow back for hundreds of years or whatever the situation is. And, and so, but, but anyway, this individual, they're not, he's not walking very fast, and so we catch up to him. And my wife actually got to him before I did. And so she, and then he starts jawing at her about these plants and about staying on the trail. And, and I get it. It's a thing. It's a thing. I know it's a thing. We're not from here, though. So we don't realize it's as much of a thing as you think it is. But at any rate, I get it. I get it. We, nobody wants to step on the plant that might die. At any rate, so he's talking the trash and saying stuff. And then I finally catch up. And he's still yelling. He's, he's 
talking to her, and he's a big guy. He's talking down to her, and then he's saying stuff to my kids, and I just get up there. I'm like, man, you, you need to stop yelling at my, my family. This is, this is getting way out of, this is too much. And he said, well, that, that plant won't grow back. I'm like, I don't care if it takes a million years for the plant to grow back. You're going to quit yelling at my family. This is just not, this isn't good, okay? And he said, well, I had to yell. You wouldn't have heard me. I said, the whole city heard you. The, everybody, there is not a person in Colorado that did not hear what you just had to say. And, and then at that point, you know, I'm from the South, and so there's things that you do in these kind of these tense moments. And, um, and, and so I sunned him. I don't, I don't, if you're from the South, you get in that, you're like, son? And, and so I sunned him. And I shouldn't have sunned him, but I sunned him. And I said, son, you just can't, you just shouldn't do this. And he's, don't call me son. And, and his head's about to explode. Um, and then he starts, then he really digresses. And it, I'm, then he starts calling me trash and garbage. Go back to wherever you came from. And I said, man, I'm a pastor. And my name's Kyle Eidelman. It's good to, <laughs> I'm kidding, I didn't do that. I didn't do that, I didn't do that. No, but I, I, I just was like, this is insane. I just said, I'm, I'm out, I'm out. He wanted to fight. I'm like, this is, this is getting, this is crazy. This is crazy. So I start walking away, and he's continuing to give us advice. But at any rate, I know that that's a rather extreme example. But I'll say this. If your advice requires you to yell at somebody that's not getting hit by a train, it's probably bad advice. I'm just saying that. But at any rate... We have people in our lives, and we have situations in our lives and, and that, that, that we need advice on. And we have people in our lives who need our advice. And how we navigate that and how we sort through that, in a lot of ways, in my opinion, is some of the most Christ-like behavior that we can have. Because if your advice is correct, and you come along somebody, alongside somebody in just the right way, and you say something how you're supposed to say it, and you say essentially what you're supposed to say, you can affect the trajectory of somebody's faith, really even, you might say, for the rest of their life, at the very least for a short period of time. And if you know, and if you can have somebody come alongside you, and you know, you know that you need to, and you're asking the right questions, which is hard to do, hard to do, but if you can have somebody come alongside you and get, give you a little bit of healthy advice, and no matter what it is that you're going through, maybe you're suffering, suffering, maybe you're struggling, maybe you're just confused, if you can have somebody give you a little bit of advice in just the right way, your life can be changed. And some of the reasons some of you are, are maybe frustrated right now with kids or maybe grandkids or even with a spouse is you don't know how to say what you need to say. And maybe you can't say what you feel like you need to say. Or maybe you need somebody to come alongside you. I mean, I look back at my life, and I was telling my son this just the other day. I transferred colleges early on, and I said, son, I wish... I would have had, I, I didn't have, I grew up in a single parent home, so I didn't have a dad along, come alongside me. I said, son, I wish I would have had a dad to come alongside me and say, don't do that. And here is why. And I look back on that, and the Lord's good. Everything's been redeemed. My life is great, but I wish that that would have been different. I wish that would have been better, but I didn't have anybody. I didn't have anybody there that, at least anybody that needed to speak into my life the way that they needed to. And we have people in our church that are worrying about school stuff, private, public, homeschool, charter. What do we do? I know it's tough. We have people in our church that are struggling right now with cancer. A woman in our church named Lori Van Cleve, stage four lymphoma. You, if you know her, you should reach out to her, love her, care for her, tell her you're praying for her, encourage her, help the family out. There's a couple of kids involved too. It's tough. One of the best things that you can know how to do is come alongside somebody who's struggling, suffering, hurting, confused. And then one of the best things you can know how to receive is when somebody comes alongside you and gives you that same type of encouragement, guidance, and wisdom. But we aren't very good at that. Now, we may not end up on a trail screaming, some, screaming your head off about something. But we still might not do it in the right way. And so we're going to look very broad, very broadly at these several chapters of the book of Job at how Job's friends ended up handling the situation that he's in all wrong. And in that, we're going to learn some lessons and we're going to get some questions. And this is, again, so important because people need some of your wisdom. Let me say it like this. People need this wisdom, and if you believe in this, and you believe in God's word, people need his word now and his truth now more than ever. 
Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14 says this, Where there is no guidance, the people fall, but in abundance of counselors, there is victory. And so Job, in theory, should end up okay. Things should end up better for him. And so he has these people come alongside him. These people being Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, Elihu. Now, and let me just say, if you take advice from somebody named Zophar, you and I are going to have to sit down and talk, okay? Can you imagine the childhood that person would have had? I mean, what those parents would have been like to name their child Zophar? Okay, not good. But in this day, it was okay. So, this in, so these people come alongside Job, and they sit with him for seven days. And then there just comes this point where it's like, ah, we got to say something. And so they do. If someone ventures a word with you, Job chapter 4, verse 2, will you be impatient? Ha, but who can keep from speaking given this situation? And the words that they speak are some words that we can draw a lot from. And even some words that Job says himself. Verse 27 of chapter 5 of Job, this is one of the first points that they make. And they make this point after they've already examined Job and they've said, Job, I know you think you're a good guy. I know you think you're blameless, but obviously you're not. And then they make this statement, this very arrogant statement. We have examined all of this and we believe it is true. Now, you may not be a Christian, and I'm so excited that you're with us. But if you're a Christian, you've got to understand, this is your truth. This is what is true. My opinions can be a little short-sighted. My opinions can, be, uh, can become infa- are for sure fallible. Okay? My perspectives can be off. But this is not. This is truth. This is God's word. And this is what we need more and more of in our world today. And what they are essentially saying is what we have said is true. And what that leads to is this question. First question whenever you receive advice. Is it biblical? Is it biblical? Not will it help your career. Because that's the question that we jump to. Not will it make you more wealthy. Not will it make your life easier. The question is, is it biblical? It's kind, of, it's kind of like this. Well, let me read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. This is where we get this from. All Scripture is God-breathed. All of it. God is perfect. The reason He is God is because He is over all things. He is with us. He is supreme. God. All Scripture is God-breathed. Therefore, it is perfect too. So we have this inerrant Word of God that is ours. Well, what is this Word's purpose? This is what the purpose of God's Word is. To be Useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, when you receive advice, when you give advice to people, what this is essentially telling you is this, is you take that advice and you run it through a filter of God's word, and you take out all the impurities and the things that are broken that you've received. It's kind of like water filtration, those water filtration systems that some of you have. You know, you turn on your water and the brown stuff comes out and you're like, ah, I probably shouldn't drink that. Uh, Like in Florida right now, there's this brain-eating amoeba in Charlotte County. Have you read about this? It's unbelievable that this is going on. And they say to you, make sure you don't let that water get in your nose. And I'm thinking, what? You don't let that water get anywhere near you. If there's a brain-eating amoeba, are you serious? At any rate, many of you have water filtration processes to keep not just the contaminants and amoebas, but also to keep minerals and other things that could hurt your body out of your system. God's Word functions like a very similar filter, that when you allow the advice that you receive to be filtered through, then all of the, all of the greed, the pride, the arrogance, all of it gets pushed aside, and then what comes through are the things that can help you to be loving and kind and self-controlled and to be somebody who's actually following after Jesus. And so is the advice that you are receiving biblical? And what Job was receiving was not in line with God's will. And the text goes on. Job chapter 11, verse 13 and 15. This is Zophar speaking. Yet if you devote your heart to him, and so this is their advice, and stretch out your hands to him, being God, if you put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent, 
Then free of fault you will be and you will lift up your face and you will stand firm and be without fear. In other words, there's a causation here that Job, if you just live the right life, then everything's going to work out and be all right. But it wasn't like that, and these people didn't understand that. Eliphaz says it this way in Job chapter 4, verse 8. Those who sow trouble will then reap it, Job. Job, clearly there's something wrong with you. But in Job chapter 1, verse 8, we find the truth. All right, track with me here. Then the Lord said to Satan, describing who Job was, Have you considered my Satan, my servant Job, Satan? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. So God's description of Job is one of blamelessness. But then Job's friends come alongside him and say, Well, Job, clearly something's wrong here. Something is messed up because you've got all these bad things happening to you. Here's the second question to ask when you receive advice. Is it factual? Is it, is it true? Because sometimes you get advice and it's not necessarily biblical or it's not about it being biblical or unbiblical because it probably could be biblical, but it's just so detailed you just don't know. It's like me sitting and telling you, you need, you're married, you need to go on date nights. That's like, that's good advice, right? That's good advice. But then somebody says, well, you know, you need to go on date nights twice a week. Well, I I mean, that's not in the Bible. Maybe that needs to happen depending on the circumstance, but maybe not. Or somebody would look at you and say, well, or like me, you feel you are really proud. You are a proud person. You know, maybe. I think I'm more selfish than proud, truthfully, truthfully. But I mean, maybe. So what am I going to sort? How do I sort all that out? I know I shouldn't be proud. Is what you are being told factual? There's a common phrase today that is used, it's called gaslighting. And gaslighting is essentially when you see something in somebody, it's like a small little issue, something. And then somebody makes it a big issue because they have some ulterior motive. And they want you to be a certain way, they want you to do a certain thing, and so then they explode this issue and, they, and it's called gaslighting. And it's from a movie from the 1940s. And the movie, the premise of the movie was this. There was a man named Gregory. He married a woman named Paula because he wanted her estate. But in order to get the money, he had to convince her that she was crazy, that she would get convi- co- committed to an insane asylum. And so in order to do this, he does all these different things, and then he pretends like everything's okay. Like, for example, in the attic, there's noise. He makes noise. And then he tells her, oh, there's nothing. I don't hear anything. There's nothing going on. And she's saying, yes, I hear something. And he's saying, no, I don't hear anything. And so then she begins to question herself. And then, then he moves around some things, and he accuses her of stealing something or misplacing things. And she starts to doubt, again, her sanity. And then where the name of the movie and the, this phrase comes from, he dims the gas lights in the home to make it look dimmer in the house. And then she goes to him and says, why is it so dim in here? And he's like, it's not dim, it's bright. i got to wear sunglasses, it's so bright. It's so bright in this house. And then all of a sudden, she's not able to go out in public because she's losing her sanity, but there really wasn't anything going on there. It was somebody with some very, very, very unhealthy and ulterior motives. We had a family member of ours uh, go to a counselor years ago. And counselors are very helpful. I, some of you are even counselors. And counseling has been very helpful for me. Like, I went through like 7,000 hours of counseling all right, not to learn to be a counselor, but to work out my issues. And so I go through all the counseling. Some of it, a lot of it's very, very helpful. But anyway, we had a family member of ours go to a counselor. She comes away from the counselor, and she thinks she had like a bad childhood. And she did it. Like she had the best childhood. She had an incredible childhood. Great parents loved each other, loved her, provided for her, gave her all these great experiences. I look at her childhood, and I'm like, why couldn't I have that childhood? I would have loved that childhood. But it was just a person is really pushing their issues onto her. And it just wasn't true. It wasn't factual. She had a great childhood. Now, I'm sure that counselor has helped out a lot of people. But in that case, that wasn't accurate. My point is this, is whenever you're receiving advice, you got to ask yourself, is it factual? Job received advice and they said, man, you're bad. You are a bad person. I know you don't think you are. I know there's really no real evidence, but clearly something's off here. And it wasn't. God even said he was blameless. And here's the thing, whenever you know what the truth is, it'll set you free. 
John chapter 8, verse 32. For verse 32 says this, and the truth will set you free. So coming back to the story, in the big picture, Job, in the big picture, if you can really imagine here, Job didn't need a theological debate about his crisis. He didn't need somebody examining his soul, examining how he'd messed up, how, as they would assume that he had messed up. He didn't need all of that. The point here, the third question is this, is, is it necessary? Is it necessary for you to say it? Is it necessary for you to do something about it? And I've, I've got this rule in my head for myself that if I'm with somebody and I'm not sure if I should say something, I'm a man and I shouldn't say it. I'll just say that. I know I should not say something. But I don't always do that. And sometimes I say things that aren't necessary. And then at times I'm also asking myself, am I supposed to do anything with this? And Job's friends missed the whole point. They were just supposed to be there for them. Because sometimes people just need a hug. Sometimes people just need you to sit next to them. Somebody's going through cancer treatment, they probably just need you to be there and say, you know what, you're going through a lot, and, and you look like better than I could have ever looked given the circumstance and situation that you're in. But they don't need much more than that. And I think most of us understand that. I think most of us get that. But is it necessary? Second Timothy, we get this advice from the Apostle Paul. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because all they do is produce more quarrels. And too many people, I even had this with my wife just a couple days ago, and thankfully I saw the light and I thought, you know, it's not necessary for me to say something. And I had such a better weekend because of that. (laughs) And that's probably the reason some of you came to church today. You just needed to hear that. Just don't say anything. Just leave it alone. But I've had a lot of times where I said something and it was like, oh my gosh, the next 48 hours were awful. Sometimes you just shouldn't say stuff. And in this case, they couldn't help themselves. They said something they shouldn't have. They got it right in Job chapter 2, verse 13. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. And no one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. There just wasn't a problem there to fix. Now, the writer of the book of Job, does anybody know who the writer of the book of Job is? It's not a trick question. It's Job. <laughs> Job or Jesus? If I ever ask you a question, just say Jesus. Like, always acceptable. Anyway, the writer of the book of Job is Job. And so he's got all these years to reflect back on what it is that has happened to him. And as he's reflecting on this situation, what is amazing about this is is he ends up writing he ends up writing this incredible book and then he says god never answered my question and we'll get to that in a couple of weeks he wanted to know why he was suffering he wanted to know why he had these people around him but he doesn't get that answer instead through it all god just simply tells him god just simply says i'm god and you are not and here's the third question that we get here questions to ask if you're giving advice to somebody else is it teachable Because Job's friends, they were very judgmental in this moment. They weren't really trying to come alongside him and help him. And in this particular case, they didn't have anything really to offer him that was teachable. Are you sharing something with somebody that's really going to help them? Or are you sharing something with somebody that's just going to judge them? Maybe there's a time to come alongside them, but often it may have to be somebody else. The text then goes on in Job chapter 4, verse 6. They they say to him, Should not your piety be your confidence and your blameless ways, your hope? Again, they're incredibly, incredibly, incredibly arrogant about what it is that they're saying. And I think we all know, like, we all say this, like, I'm not perfect. Nobody's ever accused you of being perfect. But I know, you're not perfect, I'm not perfect. We all get that. But when we give advice to people, we often act like we're perfect. The second question is this, if you're giving advice to somebody, catch this. Does it acknowledge the imperfections of human counsel? Job chapter 4, verse 8 says that they've observed it. Job chapter 5, verse 27, they said, we've examined this and it is true. In other words, we know something is wrong with you, Job, and you, you've got to figure that out. Whatever it is, that's why you're having all these problems. But they don't acknowledge They don't acknowledge that God could be up to something else. 
One of my favorite books in my, in my office is this book that was written by Colin Powell. And the title is so appropriate to this point because the title of the book is It Worked For Me. And that's what you should, I should say. Like, I, you're going through this problem. Here's an experience that I had in this situation. I don't know if it'll work for you, but it worked for me. It worked for me. That's all the whole point of the book is. I mean, leadership principles and these best practices, they can work one way in one situation and another way in another situation. You get totally different outcomes. But in that particular, I, but in this particular case, his friends are just coming at him so confident. They're not even acknowledging that they could be wrong. If I, us just coming into a situation and just saying, this must be really difficult for you. I don't know what to say, but I'm here for you. That is acknowledging that we have a finiteness about our advice. You coming into a situation and saying, just be honest, I would have reached out sooner, but I didn't know what to say, and I'm sorry. You're just acknowledging the imperfection of that. That will help you to enter into a relationship. That would help me better to come alongside somebody. Acknowledge the limitation that you have. In John chapter 9, there's this great example of this. We don't know everything. So Jesus and his disciples are walking down the street. The disciples see a man who's blind, and they ask the question, who sinned, him or his parents? Because this theology from Job is perpetuated through time, thousands of years up to that day. And then Jesus says this in verse 3 of John chapter 9. He says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. In other words, you've missed the point entirely. In other words, you don't know everything. And you need to acknowledge that, frame that up in your approach as you come to people. And as I come to people and offer advice. The third question is this, is if you're going to give advice to somebody, and I know some of you have need to do that in people's lives, is it going to be spoken in love? In Job chapter 8 verse 4, this is what his friends said to him amazingly unbelievably and callously. When your children sinned against God, he, God, gave them over to the penalty of their sin. In other words, Job, your kids died because of sin in their lives. There's absolutely no love and no kindness in that. Ephesians chapter 4, though, tells us this, that speaking the truth in love, we grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. When you give advice, you always, always have to speak it with respect, with kindness. I would even encourage you to, ca- to package it in, giving people the benefit of the doubt. Maybe you must be having, you see somebody's like being rude or they're being brash. It seems like you're having a bad couple of days. Even though in the back of your head, you know, like, man, this is just an awful person. <laughs> but, you, but they've just been having, but you're saying, you know, it seems like you're just having a hard time. What, how can I help you? What, what's going on? Are you okay? That's love. You're leading in with grace. If you don't do this, 1 Corinthians 13 says this, that if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, if I give advice, even if I have the wisdom of an angel, I'm a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal if I don't do it in love. And the best advice that you can give to anybody And the best advice that you can receive from somebody, and I just want to give it to you now, is that you need to come to Jesus. And my guess is that there are some of you right now that are struggling and you're staying up late at night or maybe you sleep for a few hours and you wake up at two and you can't go back to bed. I get it. We have things on our mind. We have people that are bothering us. We have struggles. We have addiction issues. And you need to come to Jesus. And right now you're carrying a burden that you weren't meant to carry. And you need to come to Jesus. You have, a, you have a yoke that is way too much for you, and you're not meant to take that on. And that's why Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Because right now all you're doing is learning from the world. You're just learning from these imperfect sources, but you need to learn from me. And these people that are rude and awful and terrible to you, you need to stop. But come to me because I'm gentle and humble in heart, 
and you will find what you have so desperately need. Your situation may not change, things may still be hard, but you will finally find rest for your soul. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so I just want to leave you with that bit of advice. To just come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. And let's come to him now in a word of prayer. And our team's going to lead us in one more song of worship. Father, I pray, Lord, that we would come alongside people and offer advice that is godly, that is biblical. Pray, Lord, that we would be open to receiving that from others. But God, we come to you now because you've told us to. And we come to Jesus and we pray for that easiness and that rest. And God, may life, may life, life may not get easier, but we pray for your, you, you, God, to be with us. And God, may we rest in that in the name of Jesus. Amen.